It's Wednesday night. We're in the book of Psalms, the second chapter. Perhaps it might be helpful in your study to give you sort of a brief outline. Uh, in Psalm chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, it describes mankind's rebellion against God. In verses 4 through 7, it depicts God's response to that rebellion. And then the rest of the chapter deals with a warning to those who rebel against God. Seldom do we think that when we sin, that not only do we offend God, but we're actually in rebellion against God. You do remember Paul had said in Romans chapter 5 that he commended his love toward us while we were yet sinners. So let's look at the psalm. It's a great psalm. In fact, this psalm was quoted more often in the New Testament than any other psalm, so it's important to remember that. Psalm chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. Now, <clears throat> the writer says, why do the heathen rage? Why are they so hostile against God? Uh, he's astonished. It's, it's sort of mystifying that mankind would rebel against its creator. And so, so he's rather amazed by uh, man, man's rebellion and disobedience against God. So he says, why? What, is, what has God done? I want you to think about this. What has God done to cause man to rebel against him? But he goes on to say this, and this is very important to consider. Why do the heathen rage? They're sort of like a, a mob in the street in, in uproar and turmoil. It's chaos and, and confusion. And the people in the King James says, imagine a vain thing. Now, the word uh, imagined is sort of gone out of use as, as far as what the writer intends for us to understand. What he's not talking about is dreaming up something, but they actually conspire and plot against God. And if you look at this, he'll say it is a vain thing. Of course, the word Vain means empty. In other words, this whole business of rebelling against God and conspiring against him and plotting and scheming against him is a futile thing. It, there's no hope of it succeeding. That, that ought to make us stop and think for a while that it, it, endeavoring in something and getting involved in something that is doomed to fail. Then in verse number two, he says, the kings of the earth, and I want you to think about this also, these are not the people on the street, but these are the leaders, the kings of the earth. It's almost as they have gathered together in summit, and it says there that they have set themselves, and literally the idea is they are taking a stand against God. You know, there's people like that. There's people that have hidden agendas. There's people that are conspiring. There's people who are setting themselves up against God. These are ungodly people. And here he's talking about, it, it's rather a strange picture that the kings of the earth, there's, a, there's sort of an international rebellion against God. It's global. It's universal. And so he says the kings of the earth are taking a stand. Now the image really here is like, like two opposing armies uh, uh, taking a stand against each other. It's sort of a, on the field of battle. And there he goes on to say, and, and against the Lord and against his anointed. Now the word anointed in the Hebrew just refers to the Messiah. So they are taking, they are rebelling against God and his Messiah, the anointed one. Now, I, again, I want to stress this, and we ought to think about uh, life without God, that, that that's, a, that's a futile, empty life, and that you're putting yourself in opposition to God. And we, we need to consider that uh, in a very serious way. And then he goes on to say in verse 3, now, the, it, and I've been thinking about about this verse a little bit this week, but he says, let us break. Now, this, these are the people in rebellion. They're saying, let us break, that is, cast aside their bands asunder. Now, the idea is, th their idea is that the laws of God, which were intended for the, for the goodness of man, 
God had designed his moral laws and his precepts to benefit mankind, but they look at it as a bondage. They look at it as restraint. And what they're saying is, let's break all this. Let's get rid of God. Let's get rid of all his laws, all his moral precepts. And, and, and they, want, they want to live that way. They want to live a life without God. That's the hostility there. And then they go, on to say and cast their cords and this is the this this is the the same idea of bondage and they feel they must get rid of it now this this uh this uh, chapter psalm chapter two was quoted in acts chapter four it's quoted in some other places but because of our brevity together tonight i want us to just look at uh, acts chapter four and uh, beginning in verse number 24 now you may remember the context of Acts chapter 4 was that uh, there was a man that had been uh, lame from birth and he had been healed and, and that hurts the ruling body, the Sanhedrin, in, in some distress because they couldn't deny the miracle. And people were believing that Jesus is the Christ and he is, and so they wanted to put a stop to it. In fact, in the chapter, you'll find that they forbid and prohibit the apostles to speak any further. And of course, that's just not going to happen. And so in verse 24 is really after all this has taken place, that is, they've been persecuted and they've been beaten, uh, they return to uh, the company of their disciples or believers, and they report all the things that had just happened to them. And so in verse 24, and when they heard that, that is, the believers, when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God. Here, here is the congregation and responding together in prayer uh, to God. And it's interesting, I think, uh, it goes on to say they're, they're praying in one accord or praying together. And, and here they said, the Lord, thou, thou art God. This is their prayer. They're saying to God, you are God. You have made the heavens and you have made the earth and you have made the sea and you made, you made everything in them. Now, there's two things I want to say about that verse. Number one is they had just been persecuted and beaten, and yet they recognized that God still is in control, and he has sovereignty. And then the second thing I want you to note there is that uh, it's a good thing for us to be reminded of this, and I, I'm, I'm saying that because I think I'm speaking to people who deeply believe in God, but sometimes we just need to be reminded of the reality of that truth, that God is the creator, and we are the creation, and he has created everything in it. Can I say it again for a moment? We need to be constant reminded of that fundamental truth that God has created us. He is the creator. In the beginning, he created the heavens and the earth, and he created man in Genesis 1:27 in his image. And we need to remember that, although the America is becoming more and more secular. Now watch it here. In verse number 25, now this here, they're actually quoting in their prayer the Psalm chapter 2. I, I want you to think they are quoting they they know the bible they're quoting the scriptures and you know when i was thinking about this this might be digressing just a little bit but have you ever thought about probably the devil knows the bible and he can probably quote the whole thing and and it's a sad thing when we can't even quote a few verses we need to we need if we're going to meditate on the scriptures and we're going to read them it's a good thing to to put those in your memory it's an amazing thing you could be walking down the street or sitting somewhere and, and though these verses that come to your head they'll come to your mind and they become so encouraging and so helpful but let me go ahead and read this uh, lest i start digressing too much uh, who by the hand or the mouth of the servant David. Now, again, implied here is that the Old Testament is inspired by God. In some other translations, it will say by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of David. David was speaking by inspiration. God was using his mouth, but these were inspired words. And so what we're seeing in Acts 2 is the fulfillment of the prophecy that was given in Psalm chapter 2. I try to tell people and remind 
him of another great truth is that prophecy is such a tremendous evidence of the validity of the Bible. It comes from God. The Bible is the book of God. It's not some fairy tale. It's just not some story to be told. But here he's talking about a prophecy that had taken a million, not a million, but a thousand years before him. And through that time, it finally has fulfilled in the New Testament. So he's saying here, by the mouth and the servant of David, why do the heathen rage? That's just, that's just, it's just amazing why man rebels and why, why they, why they resist the, the laws of God. And so he goes on to say, and the people imagine again, conspire and scheme up evil things. And then in verse number 26, and the kings of the earth and have stood up, that is, they have set themselves against God. They have drawn the battle lines, and the rulers have gathered together. They conspired together, uh, just like some evil people do, against the Lord and against the Christ. Now, in the context, I won't go any further because I want to get back to Psalm chapter 2. But in the context, he's referring, if you read further, about how Pilate, and uh, Herod got together. They conspired together. Previously, they couldn't get along. They, they were almost enemies. And now, you see, they come together as, as if they got some great enemy to fight. And so you see in there the Gentiles, the Romans, and the Jews had gathered together in a kind of a strange way to rebel against God. Now back to Psalms, and let's go ahead and it's just a brief psalm, but let's read verse 4 and following. Now, he that sitteth, now this is God's response to their rebellion, and God does respond. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. Now, he's not talking about laughing in some kind of heartless or cruel way. But you got to remember something. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, he's also going to reap. So it isn't that it isn't something heartless or funny or anything like that. And so he says he shall he shall have them in derision. Now notice verse five. And he shall speak unto them in wrath. Now, slow down a minute. Uh, think about someone speaking to you in wrath. Here, the word refers to in burning anger. That's a fearful thing for someone to speak to you like that. And uh, here he's speaking to those who have rebelled against him. He's going with the voice of anger. And then it goes on, and he will vex them or confound or trouble them. I like the idea of he's going to terrify them in sore displeasure. It's no light thing to those of you who are listening tonight to rebel against God. It's a fearful thing. And it, it is, it's a thing that we must take seriously. You recall that Paul had said in Romans 11, and by the way, this is New Testament, in verse 22, behold, and this, when you say behold in the King James, it means you're 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 struck with awe and astonishment. Behold the goodness of God, and that's preached a lot, and it's a great thing. The goodness of God, what a wonderful thing! But behold the goodness of God and His severity unto them which fell, severity, but unto you goodness if you continue in His goodness. So. He's speaking again about those who rebel and turn against God. Uh, he's going to deal with that in a very severe way. Then in verse number uh, six, in spite of their rebellion, God in his absolute authority and sovereignty will set his king upon the holy hill in Zion. And I will declare this decree, he says in verse number seven, that uh, thou art my son uh, and, uh, and that, I have, that I have begotten thee. And uh, that's quoted in Hebrews chapter one and verse five and, and a number of other places. And then in verse number eight, ask of me and I will give thee an inheritance for thine inheritance. The other most parts of the earth are your possession. And then number verse nine and following. And, and I want to just uh, emphasize what he says. And we've been kind of inferring this, but listen to hear what God is saying. There is a definite warning here about those who oppose the Lord. And uh, he goes on to say that he shall break them with a rod of iron. 
think of the taking a rod of iron to a piece of pottery, shatter that and crush it, uh, and he, and that's exactly what he's saying against those who rebel. Those, those I will break with a rod of iron, and thou shalt dash into pieces like a potter's vessel. Then verse 10, notice, and, we, and I want to slow down and just say this very slowly. Be wise, therefore. Be wise, O you kings, and be instructed, discern, and learn, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord instead of rebellion. Serve the Lord with fear and trembling. And, uh, you know, there, there is a sense where we need to work out our own salvation in fear and trembling. And the idea, of course, it's not that God wants us to serve him in some kind of slavish fear. But there is a thing about uh, rebelling against God, and that's where fear ought to be. You know, fear is a good thing sometimes. You know, you get on top of a building, you ought not to be fooling around. You ought to fear falling. So there is a sense where fear is a good thing, okay? So now he goes on to say, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. And then verse number 12 is an invitation. When he says, kiss the son, he's talking about we ought to, not, we ought to submit and be humble before God and uh, lest he be angry. Now, now, the whole context, and this, this may not be a pleasant chapter for some, but the whole context is dealing with people who deliberately rebel against God, who look at his laws and, his, and, and all of this as a restraint. They want to live without boundaries. They don't want God in their life. And so he's dealing with those in that context. He's not talking about people who are serving him, but people who refuse to and have turned against him. And so God is giving him them a warning. And you know, a warning is a good thing. It stops us from doing uh, uh, bad things. And and so he'll say, uh, lest, lest ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled and not a little. Blessed are they. And of course, it's a, it's a positive end. And, and, uh, and blessed are you. And blessed are all of those who put their trust in him. So that's Psalm chapter 2. It's a, it's a uh, challenging psalm. Uh, it is a prophecy of the Messiah to come, the anointed one who will rule and he will reign. And he is reigning right now. He's sitting at the right hand of God. And the invitation is a tremendous invitation where he says, trust him and put your trust in him. And you remember that in Matthew, the 28th chapter, as he was sending his disciples into all the world, he talked about he was backed by all the authority in heaven and earth. And that's why he said, go ye therefore and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And by the way, we won't talk about baptism. Some night we will, but when you are baptized, properly baptized, as a believer and, and a penitent believer, that is repenting of your sins, you actually have to remember that God, you're putting your trust in him, and when you are baptized, he'll take away all your sins. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that, but I hope that uh, we have briefly brought some points out that will help you in your study of the Bible. And we'll continue in our study of the Psalms, and we'll be looking at Psalm chapter 3 uh, next Wednesday.